Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My guest this week is Dr. Heather Grab. Dr. Grab is a senior lecturer at Cornell University's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in the School of Integrated Plant Science. In this role, she teaches multiple courses focusing on cannabis cultivation and processing and mentors students in Cornell's Hemp Master of Professional Studies program. In collaboration with Cornell experts and industry partners, she delivers best practices for the cultivation and processing of cannabis and industrial hemp to professionals in the Northeast and beyond. Prior to this position, Heather was a USDA NIFA postdoctoral researcher in the entomology department at Cornell and continues to explore interactions between hemp and insects with her students and collaborators. Now on to the show. Hi Heather, thanks for coming on the show today. It's a pleasure to be here, Todd. Yeah, let's start off uh, just telling listeners a little bit about yourself and then uh, we'll dive into your program. Absolutely. Um, so I'm Dr. Heather Grab. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Integrative Plant Science at Cornell University, where I teach courses and mentor students in our Hemp Science MPS program and collaborate with my colleagues in various different departments and our industry partners to learn more about the cultivation and processing of hemp and cannabis. Yeah, I was so excited when we connected uh, because, uh, one, it's great to see more and more universities coming online and see uh, programs like this that we're going to talk about. But also just Cornell itself has such a rich agricultural history. Um, it's such a prestigious school that it's, I, it's just very exciting for me. So thank you. It's exciting for me as well. We're definitely seeing a whole new ecosystem of education options pop up, both informal education, like your podcast, um, but also certification programs, associate's degree programs at community colleges, bachelor's degree um, majors and minors in cannabis, as well as now some graduate level courses. Well, let's talk a little bit about the hemp science program at Cornell. Can you, can you give a little background into what it entails? Yeah, I can definitely do that. So um, I think you're exactly right about Cornell being very well positioned because of our land grant mission, which means that um, we serve the need of a diverse community of stakeholders in terms of translating the latest knowledge that's out there and generating new knowledge in areas that are needed, like Uh, cannabis and hemp science. So our MPS program was developed to meet the needs of this growing industry within New York State and beyond. Um, It is a one-year course intensive, although very much hands-on, accredited master's degree program that covers all aspects of the hemp and cannabis industry. So from genetics to site selection, different cultivation practices, processing those raw materials that are grown into high value products and focusing on product development, even covering areas like pharmacology. And we cover a really broad array of different topics so that students have a complete understanding of the industry from start to finish. And our ability to be able to cover all those topics is very much supported by our team of expert faculty from many different areas, whether it's seed science, weed science, breeding, genetics, plant pathology, food science, uh, the law school, the business school, as well as extension professionals who are working directly with growers that have their you know, hands in the soil and hands on plants, and industry partners. So all coming together 
that are actively working to support our curriculum in each of those areas. Yeah, and folks can go on the website. Uh, we'll have a link on the podcast page, but you can literally type in Cornell Hemp Science and it'll be the first hit there on Google. So it's easy to find. Um, it is a master's program, like you mentioned. I'm on the website right now. Uh, I'm curious as to what sorts of uh, careers or what sorts of, of people are taking the program um, and, and where are they ending up in the industry? Great question. So um, our students who enter the program all already have a bachelor's degree. Um, they don't necessarily need to be uh, folks with an extensive science background. Their degree area might not be even in a science field. As long as they're fairly comfortable um, with the sciences and have a couple science-based courses um, on their transcripts, they should do fine in our classes. And we are most excited about supporting students that want to enter careers in industry. So our Hemp Science MPS program is a little bit different in terms of its structure as well as its goals from a traditional research track master's degree. So uh, it is a master's degree program, but with a slightly different focus where a master's that has a research focus is usually a much longer degree with very few courses, tends to be a deep dive on a much more narrow range of topics. And there is usually some substantial novel research production that happens in that kind of a degree, which is for students that may want to go and continue on in science careers or on the academic track, perhaps go on to get a PhD and to work within academia, whereas our MPS program is, again, this one-year broad introduction to all aspects of the industry where students are still completing some significant independent research work, but not the same breadth of research that a master's uh, research track student would complete. That's great. So you're looking for real, like more applicable, hands-on uh, education for people uh, on a wide variety of topics, it sounds like, um, which I think, frankly, is yeah. more useful for, for, in, for most cases. Absolutely. And you, you asked about the kinds of careers that students who enroll in our program are thinking about. And because hemp as an industry and cannabis is relatively new, students may not be exposed already to all areas. So that's one reason for having a relatively broad curriculum in terms of the areas that we're covering, again, from breeding all the way to product development and pharmacology, because they may not have had much experience, for example, in a wet lab before doing microbial testing or doing some of the analytical chemistry that is so important to the industry. So once they get some experience with that, they may realize that that is a career path that could work very well for them. Many of our students, so not to say that our students don't go into research or science careers, because we do have students that have gone on to work um, in R&D on the cultivation side or on the processing side, but many of our students do um, graduate our program and then go on to career professional careers within the industry and don't tend to stay on the science or academic track. Okay, and uh, one thing I wanna mention early on in this podcast is uh, we bumped this podcast up and recorded it a lot sooner than initially intended because the deadline to apply for this program is coming up. It's February 15th, um, which doesn't give you a lot of time if you wanted to get in there this year. Uh, but hopefully if someone listens to this and is really passionate, uh, it would give them maybe enough time to get an application in too. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of um, application requirements, of course, the student will have already needed to complete their bachelor's degree although they don't necessarily need to come right from that bachelor's. We have several students who have spent time in other career fields, finance, real estate, et cetera, and then realized later that they want to cultivate this passion for cannabis and hemp and have come to our program. So our application process is relatively streamlined. You need to submit 
a resume, you need to have your transcripts, two letters of recommendation. We don't require, for example, GREs like many research track institutions would require. So um, it's, it is relatively streamlined and there is a little bit of flexibility around that application date. So I certainly encourage you to reach out to me um, by email if you are really excited about the program but don't know if you can make that February 15th deadline. Great, and I'm looking at the list of courses here. It says hemp science courses uh, recommended. Are these the courses that someone would take in the program or are these other ones that you would recommend uh, in, in so addition many, to the core? There is a set of courses that we developed specifically to the purpose of this degree program. Um, and then there's also an opportunity to take advantage of the broad array of other classes that are offered at Cornell both within the ag sciences area, but also, you know, students may want to work on the entrepreneurship tracks, so but they may take courses in our business school. We have a fantastic school um, for hospitality here at Cornell with courses that are available for students in our program to enroll in. So we do have a set of recommended or a sample curriculum that tends to be the path that most students take but there is a lot of opportunity for students to customize the courses that they take relative to their specific areas of interest. And I'm happy to walk you through a couple of the key courses that we developed so you can get a feel for what our program is like from the fall semester when students enter the program through the spring and then during the summer when they're finishing their capstone project. Yeah, so I know you mentioned on here or to me that uh, folks that are interested in, in say, more of a, a cultivation uh, side of things, since this is a cultivation podcast, they could cater their education around more of the cultivation stuff, right? If they were less interesting, say, in, um, oh, I, I don't know, some of the processing things or the lab, the lab analytical stuff. Um, is, that, is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. So I would say one feature of our program is that we cover cannabis sativa as the full species. So that includes the cultivars that are um, adapted more for grain and fiber production, as well as those that are high cannabinoid. So students can certainly select curriculum within that series that focuses on some areas versus others. Um, they can select courses that are more on the breeding track or cultivation track or processing. But for me as an advisor, I really um, encourage students to take courses that span the entirety of the industry, particularly because um, folks who are cultivating need to be growing with that end product in mind. So whether that's a smokable flower or an extract or something that's going to go into a food product and people who are working in the processing side of the industry need to understand what's happening during cultivation so that they can make sure they're making good choices about the supply chain partners that they're working with, understand the regulations that are required of them, as well as all the nuances of the testing that's really important for quality control and quality assurance. So I, I do encourage students to take sort of the full span so they have this complete foundation in the industry, but there is still a lot of opportunity to load up on courses that are maybe you know a little bit heavier on the cultivation track. So if I had a student that came into the program and was working with me that had a strong interest in cultivation, I would certainly suggest that they take our broad overview course, which is Cannabis Biology Society and Industry, which will give them that base foundation um, across you know, many different areas of the industry. I teach a course in the fall called Hemp Production Systems, and this is a really hands-on class where we learn about the biology, the physiology, cultivation practices. For cannabis, we do visit um, field sites as well as the trials that we have on our research farms and in our greenhouses here at Cornell. So again, that 
extensive research team that we have here is doing a lot of great work that our students get firsthand experience with. We walk through um, propagation practices like germination and cloning, as well as fertilization, um, all the way up through harvest in that class. So students who are really interested in the cultivation side, I might recommend that in that fall semester, they also take our courses on plant propagation and on hydroponic production. So our plant propagation goes a lot in more in depth into best practices for clonal propagation as well as really important emerging areas like tissue culture. And then hydroponic production covers all of the best practices for controlled environment agriculture. Um, in the spring semester, students would also have the opportunity to take some really important um, courses for cultivators like integrated pest management. That's a very important topic in uh, today's society. As and uh, you know, as someone who is an entomologist yourself, I'm I'm sure you're quite aware of all the challenges that we're facing right now in the industry. Um, so that's that's wonderful. I mean, I'm looking at this list of classes, and it's quite extensive. There's quite a few classes in here that I think I would find uh, quite interesting. Um, and then along with the classes, you mentioned greenhouse, uh, field rows, and then I know you mentioned to me you have growth chambers too. So there's quite a bit of range in terms of um, the ability for a student to have access to uh, different different methods for research, I guess, or, or growing styles. Absolutely, yeah. So one thing that differentiates a lot of um, our curriculum from other universities is this ability to get really hands-on in so many different areas. So students are growing their own hemp in, for example, the hydroponic production lab or in my hemp production systems course. Uh, they're actually, you know, designing their own systems and taking those the whole way to harvest and exploring how different cultivation practices influence yields, influence plant phenotype influence the um, cannabinoid profile of flowers in the processing class. Students learn how to use an HPLC and actually do sample prep and run samples in that class. We get hands-on with um, decortication. So that's the extraction of those fibers from the stems of fiber cultivars. We do grain cleaning and sorting so we can learn how hemp heart products are made as well as press, um, cold pressed uh, hemp seed oil. There's tons of hands-on experience that is able to you know, leverage a lot of the research capacity that we have here. Now, this is kind of an out of the blue question, but do you have anything on the organic side for folks like myself that tend to have an emphasis on that? Yes, yeah, so organic production is certainly covered as a focus area in many of our courses. And we do have several courses. So I mentioned there's this opportunity for students to customize. So there are courses on organic production that students could add. We also have some that are even uh, more broad focus, including agroecology or even soil ecology. Hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, uh, talk to me a little bit about the uh, industry partners that you're currently working with and how that might tie into research projects. Yeah, so I mentioned um, earlier that our ability to cover this huge array of different topics for students is not only uh, due to our great research faculty that are involved with our courses, but also our industry partners. So we have great connections with folks in industry who come in to share their knowledge with students throughout um, the courses or in when, when the conditions allow given COVID, um, we also have the opportunity to go visit them on site as well. Um, but in some examples of this actually speaking of COVID is we are online now uh, for our first two weeks of the spring semester, which was an unexpected change and normally when my labs for hemp processing are doing some pretty intensive cannabis anatomy 
explorations and dissections to understand so the underlying structures that produce different hemp products. So because we already have these great connections with folks in the industry, I was able to call in my friends over at GrowDoc, and they're pinch hitting for me in my online labs now. So they have a um, tech platform that's an app that allows growers to diagnose different nutrient deficiencies. And one of the features that they're working on is also the ability to um, use images in that are captured in the app to understand whether your plants are male or female based on their early flower development. So we're going to work with them in the online first two weeks of lab. And then that's going to be followed, hopefully, when we're back in person again, learning some of the lab skills that are really critical for the industry with a collaboration with medicinal genomics. So all of that plant material that students worked with in the online portion of the class will be brought back to the classroom, and then we'll take samples of that and run some of the medicinal genomics um, sex testing kits and also learn how to apply those kits for detecting pathogens that can be really important for growers. We also have great collaborations with folks who are on the analytical chemistry side of the spectrum. So one great solution for um, small-scale cultivators who are interested in tracking their cannabinoid profiles and their terpene profiles, as well as some products that are offered by a company called Lucidity. So these are small scale versions of HPLCs and GCs, and we'll have the opportunity to work with their um, equipment in class, which is all of the precision of a full benchtop scale GC, but with a much smaller footprint. Um, and I think potentially even more of interest for uh, cultivators who are listening in on this is some of the other even more portable and point of use testing systems that we teach students how to use in the lab, although they're, you know, so easy to use that you certainly don't need a full course in analytical chemistry to use them. So um, an option in that arena is the light lab, which is offered by a company called Orange Photonics. So we work with Orange Photonics to um, teach the technology that they offer. So that's sort of a point of use HPLC system. It comes in essentially like a small suitcase and takes only a few minutes to prep and run a sample. So if you're thinking about harvest timing, for example, you could bring this with you into the grow room or into the greenhouse and take a small sample of plant tissue. It does work better when it's dried, but you can certainly do it fresh if you have a good approximation of Um, the moisture content of your sample and run it right there to understand what your cannabinoid profile of your plant is right in that moment, rather than waiting to send samples off to a lab or even taking them to your own in-house lab and still taking a few hours to run those. So all of these collaborations that students are um, learning in the courses they can then take advantage of when they're developing their capstone project. And we did have a really nice one with um, the folks at Orange Photonic using um, their light lab to develop a new application for chemotyping. So a chemotype is um, identifying the dominant cannabinoid profile of a plant, which often you need to wait to do until that plant has initiated the flowering phase. But we were able to develop some new methods and a new application for their equipment that can test very, very young plants, which would be a great option for folks who are pheno hunting out there. Yeah, that's really cool. I think when we were on the phone earlier, you mentioned there were some other technologies uh, similar to this too. Could you touch on that? Yeah, so I can certainly talk about those. So Um, There are a couple technologies now that are getting even faster and even less destructive. So anytime you take a sample for HPLC or LC analysis, you do need to take that tissue off the plant, grind it up, extract it with solvents. 
But there are some new platforms out there that use spectroscopy. So they're using NIR and other similar technologies with really, truly handheld applications that can allow you to scan plant material and right away link that to a database that will tell you what the cannabinoid profile or terpene profile, or really I think that there's very few limitations on the kind of information that can be generated with those systems. So if folks are thinking uh, that they want to explore that technology more, I would say a good example of that is um, from Mariposa. They're a company that's offering one of these handheld scanners that then links up with their database in order to be able to identify the signatures that are generated from that handheld module. Are you finding that they're pretty accurate? Like they correlate well with uh, HPLC and some of these other more traditional methods? So when folks have compared these methods to HPLC, they do compare very well. And part of the reason for that is because we use a whole lot of background testing of plants that were tested with HPLC and these other more industry standard regulatory testing methods to develop the databases that are then used in order to make these real-time predictions of what's happening with plants that are being scanned. So um, there, there's a high correlation among those readings, but of course, as you know, those, those models are only as good as the data that goes in. So that's one area that we're really excited about working with companies and with students in our capstone projects to develop some of the new data sets that are needed to answer additional questions. So of course, we are always excited about um, new industry partnerships that uh, folks may be interested in. So please get in touch if you, if you have a good research idea and want to work with us and work with a student. So our students are always paired up with a faculty mentor in um, their area of expertise. And sometimes they are, you know, they just work alone with that mentor on a particular research topic, but we really do encourage the students to also um, align with an industry partner to answer a question that's relevant not only to the student and advancing our knowledge more broadly as a field, but also to solving some problems that are real on the ground issues for cultivators and processors. Yeah, that's huge because traditionally there's been a big gap between uh, academia and uh, real life, you know, farmers. And so being able to bridge that and have projects that address some of the problems that, you know, farmers and growers are actually seeing in the field or in the, in their uh, facilities is, is amazing. I am hopeful that, you know, you and I talked that we might be able to collaborate on a few things or I could connect you with some of the facilities that I'm working with that would be interested in doing research if some of your students down the road had a passion for, you know, the sorts of things that we're, we're working on. So uh, I'm really excited for that. Um, one question, here. one question I had while you were talking and, uh, about COVID and, and everything, and I was thinking, okay, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm interested in this program, um, one thing we didn't address is do I need to move to New York or how are people doing this that like have families and lives and they're located in other areas around the country? Is that still an option for them to take this, take this program? So I guess this is a double-edged sword because the one thing that makes our program um, in terms of the NPS degree so distinct and have so much value is this hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. So we do have students who are enrolled in our program that don't live in um, up, you know, upstate New York here in Ithaca where our main campus is, but over the past two years, we've had a lot more flexibility in terms of offering um, options that are in person as well as those that are online. And, you know, we definitely encourage students to come here to get the opportunity to interact with our faculty, to uh, get their hands wet in a bunch of the different research labs 
on campus and to get that hands-on experience that's so critical for demonstrating that there's mastery of all of these different skills. But we are working right now to develop some online content. So the online courses that are uh, essentially the equivalent versions, but without the hands-on experience that we have are not the on the master's degree granting track, but they are certificate programs. And a great example of that is um, one of the courses that we offer in the spring semester is led by Dr. Larry Smart on hemp breeding and genetics. And he has been the first one to launch his course online through eCornell. So students can go to eCornell if they can't physically come here to campus and take the same content that he offers in his in-person version, but just online without the hands-on activities. Has anyone done sort of a hybrid model where they come down for a quarter or a semester sort of thing um is that a possibility with your program or is it is it pretty much um you need you need to be hands-on uh are you guys on quarters or semesters i don't even know which we we're on a semester system um, okay so every semester do they need have... would they need to be there for both semesters or could they come down or hmm. so it's very much encouraged but i think we are really sensitive to the different constraints on um, on individuals that may want to participate in the program. So it's potentially possible that there is some flexibility and we have a student that's participating in the program from New York City right now, which is not a short drive from Ithaca by any means. Okay. But, you know, they come to Ithaca for all of the big hands-on components. So that is, that is overall pretty critical. Um, Although we do have students who leave Ithaca that are in our program to complete their capstone projects. So last year I had a student that was able to go to Italy and explore different fiber production models, um, traveling all across Italy with um, a company called Hemp South Techno. And this year I'll have a student that's going down to North Carolina and Virginia to, again, work with another fiber company, helping them with field trials. So there's opportunity for folks to not be in Ithaca, but at least for the, the course work part of things, it's very much encouraged that you're here and able to get the most out of the hands-on experiences that we're offering. Great. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I just thought I'd ask that question in case there were people who were Curious. Um, let's talk about these capstone projects because you had listed some pretty interesting research that your students have already done and some other things that are, you know, maybe coming down the pipeline. Um, what are some examples of, uh, you know, cool research that has come out of your program over the years? So students are really encouraged to um, develop a capstone project that is in alignment with their career goals and also takes advantage of the expertise and all of the resources that we have on campus. You mentioned our research farms that we have here as well as our greenhouses and growth chambers and um, also to leverage our collaborations with industry partners. And um, I think a great example of this is a student who also finished last year, who I think you may uh, talk to in future, so I won't give away too much, but Andre Galich, who um, had took this observation from his interactions with a grower in Vermont about frost stress and cold tolerance of hemp. And developed that into a really interesting line of inquiry, exploring how frost influences the development of hemp plants, both fiber plants as well as high cannabinoid cultivars, and how that influences the cannabinoid profiles of those plants as well. So that's one great example. Uh, we also have students that are interested much more in working with growers from a consultation or extension focus. So we've had students who have paired up with um, extension professionals 
within the Cornell Cooperative Extension Network to build surveys that help us to understand what grower needs are so that we can target our research, but also so that they can get some experience understanding how to assess growers' needs within the industry and how to communicate science with them. Um, and so speaking of that, we have, a, we have a student right now who is working with uh, one of our extension professionals to develop a best practices guide for hemp cultivation in the Northeast. And so for his capstone project, he decided to take a, a bite-sized chunk out of that production guide, although it's quite a big bite, and focus on the controlled environment cultivation. So he's going to synthesize all of the science that is being generated every day. There's more and more peer-reviewed publications that are coming out as well as trials that are published um, based on different university programs. So he's going to synthesize that and also go out and do some interviews with growers to see what practices they're using on the ground and understand what questions and major limitations they might have so that we can continue to develop that guide in the future. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I actually connected on LinkedIn with uh, Connor Steven, who just graduated your program yeah. as another person to mention. Um, so it's wonderful to see these people moving into the industry and having uh, positive roles and impact uh, you know, pretty much right away. So, yeah, it's great. Um, let's see here. So beyond the growth uh, or sorry, not the growth chamber, but the capstone projects. Um, were there any more you wanted to mention there or did you want to dive into a little bit of your own research and how you got into this? Yeah, I think this is a great time to, to make that transition. And um, I feel very blessed every day that this is my job uh, because I love teaching. And my, my really my favorite thing about my job is mentoring students in areas of of research where we have overlap. And so my background you mentioned earlier is in entomology. And one of the things that got me excited about working with hemp and then transitioning to working much more with high cannabinoid cultivars, normally think of as cannabis, is um, understanding the environmental impact. Um, cannabis, especially cannabis that's grown indoors, gets a bad rap in terms of its environmental impacts, but there's also a ton of benefits to cannabis production when it comes to fiber and grain. So there's a lot of researchers that are working on understanding the ability of um, industrial hemp cultivation to sequester carbon, but one of the areas that I've done a little bit of work in is in how hemp can actually provide a resource for insect populations that we might be concerned about from a conservation perspective. And again, this was a project that was really student motivated. So one of the students I was working with at the time um, was an undergrad, Nate Flicker, wanted to work on hemp. We'd been doing a bunch of small farm survey work around the region and um, convinced me that this was something that we should go out and look at. And so Nate and I developed a project to survey the insect community of fiber hemp and grain hemp growing within the region, mostly because we had heard a lot from our grower collaborators that they were seeing a ton of bees out there on their fiber and grain plantings. And Fiber and grain hemp, hemp in general, does not have big showy flowers compared to other crops. You know, like if you imagine walking into an apple orchard or an almond orchard in full bloom and it's flowers everywhere, they're much more subtle. So they were really curious about why these insects were there um, and, and also what kind of insects were there. Some, are there some that we might be concerned about? So we did some surveys. And we ended up narrowing our focus down 
to looking at the the bees that were visiting these plots and found a surprisingly diverse community, including many native wild pollinators what, that we are potentially concerned about in terms of their populations and the impact of agriculture and climate change and other factors. So, of course, there were honeybees there, but honeybees are not native in North America. So there was also um, a really common visitor, that, which is called the common eastern bumblebee, um, one of our larger bee species we have, as well as carpenter bees that we're visiting, all the way down to tiny, itty-bitty little sweat bees. So they span the full gamut of different sizes, different colors of bees that are all using the industrial hemp as a resource. And what they're actually doing is they are they're collecting pollen from the male plants in these industrial hemp plantings. So if you were growing high cannabinoid hemp and you happen to have a male, although we all hope that that's not the case, you would very likely also see these wild bees showing up and collecting some of that pollen from your male pollen producing plants. Yeah, now you speculate a little bit about why they were, uh, there were so many bees showing up on these male plants. Um, do you wanna to touch on that? Absolutely. So anyone who has encountered a male hemp plant before knows that they produce astounding amounts of pollen from an individual plant. So one aspect is just this volume of pollen that's being produced during the midsummer period. And if you think about it, the midsummer when it's dry is actually a time when there are very few other flowers that are blooming abundantly. So even though industrial hemp only offers pollen from these male plants, neither the male or the female plants offer any nectar resources for bees because there are relatively few other floral resources out there for them during this midsummer gap period, they're able to pretty quickly learn to go visit these hemp plants as a source of pollen. Um, and the hemp plants do contain cannabinoids in their pollen, although it is at relatively low levels. So we had a, a lot of interest from beekeepers who were worried that their bees, or in some cases were maybe excited about the potential for their bees to be bringing back all of these cannabinoids and then incorporating those into hive products that they might be selling like beeswax or propolis or pollens or importantly, honey. But what we found from looking at the levels of cannabinoids in those hive products is that you would have to eat an enormous amount of either the pollens directly or the honey in order to get anything near a recommended dose. Yeah, you had said like in pounds or in gallons, it was a ridiculous number, like more than any human could ever consume in a year, much yeah, less. Yeah, so a, in terms of pollen, sitting. because that's where it's the most concentrated, um, and again, cannabinoids are lipophilic, so they really like to go into those fatty substances. Um, it tend, you'd have to eat about 75 pounds to wow. get an effective dose. And in terms of honey, because again, honey is not high in lipids, so there's not a lot of cannabinoids that are extracted into the honey, you'd have to eat well over 2,000 pounds of honey. You would al almost certainly die from eating that amount of honey before you got high from it. Now that's a good thing because if we were finding the THC showing up in the honey, that would have created a whole bunch of regulatory issues and nightmares for honey producers and also for people wanting to grow uh, cannabis or hemp. So this is a this is a good finding in a lot of ways, I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure there were one or two other um, entrepreneurial beekeepers out there who were a little disappointed by those results. But I think overall a big sigh of relief from many in the beekeeping side of the industry. Yeah. And as someone who formerly had honeybees, um, they're amazing creatures. I was told that a honeybee could fly away out, you know, 
two to three miles away from a hive on a day, come back, find a nectar or pollen source or something, a resource for the hive, fly back, do a little dance in front of the hive, and that would actually be able to tell other bees where to go to find the same resource. Is that you, you know, have accurate? you have been told the correct story. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly what honeybees do. Bees are incredibly smart creatures. So not only are they able to stumble upon this brand new pollen resource in their environment and learn that it actually is something that's worth their while to forage for, they can also go back to their hives, communicate the location of that resources and recruit additional foragers to those sites. So yeah, they're certainly very, very intelligent little creatures. And because, you know, they're they're out there trying to forage as efficiently as possible. They learn very, very quickly that it's only the male plants, only those male inflorescences that are providing that pollen resource. So in all of our survey work um, across many, many different fields and farms, we really never saw any bees going to female flowers even though these are plants that were grown in mixed male and female stands for fiber and grain production. So they're not making those mistakes that may potentially result in the transmission of pollen from, let's say, you know, your neighbor's plants who maybe bought some seeds online to the plants that you might be cultivating. So if there is male plants in the vicinity and you get pollination, it's almost certainly because of the wind and not mm -hmm. because of the bees. So if you see a male plant nearby with bees on it, you already have a big problem. <laughs> That's good. So it's not the bees' fault if your plant gets pollinated. It's the wind yeah. um, or your neighbor. So even, <laughs> even if it's not a great outcome for you, at least the bees get you know, a little bit of the silver lining there. So that viral video of a, you know almost harvestable female uh plant uh cannabis plant that w that ha was covered in bees um is really not anything we're seeing occurring in nature they may have used some sort of attractant or um it might have it didn't look like a swarm to me um and from the photo but um i i know you you and i talked about this because you, you'd seen the photo too but there was a lot of speculation around it that we were going to have bees that were high which we should talk about you should tell me what you shared on that too but also that you know we were going to have honey that was going to make you high and all this other stuff so if you could dispel some of those things yeah absolutely so i have never seen that happening um in all of my observations of bees on hemp over the past several years however you know it's it's possible that it could have happened in a you know in an organic manner, you know, without maybe people applied some sort of attractant, which there certainly are attractants that can be applied to flowers. But there is two potential, although somewhat unlikely, options. One is that um, those honeybees were going and collecting the glandular trichomes in order to build one of the hive products that they use as an antimicrobial compound, and it helps to structurally seal up gaps within the hive. It's called propolis. You'll also see this in a lot of body care products around because of those antimicrobial properties. So that is possible. However, I would not expect that to happen unless there is nothing else for them to collect to turn into that propolis. It seems really unlikely that they would use um, cannabis trichomes for that. And then the other, you know, potentially unlikely option is that those inflorescences could have had a cannabis aphid outbreak. And honeybees are actually known to, to collect the secretions of those aphids. So actually, it's, you know, really oh, the feces of the aphids. The honeydew. Because they, the honeydew, exactly. Oh. So those aphids are sucking up tons and tons of the sugary plant juices, filtering out most, but certainly not all of the sugars, and then excreting that. And honeybees will go and collect that as a source of sugar. So it is possible that, that those inflorescences in that viral image 
had actually just a an, a cannabis aphid or some other aphid infestation, and the bees were there to collect that honeydew. But you know, who knows? This is all wild speculation. Um, but one area that I think is kind of interesting is you know I I get a lot of questions from the general public, and again, as well as from beekeepers about why the bees are going to collect this pollen in the first place, what makes it so attractive outside of just being present at this time when there's maybe not much else around. Um, And uh, many people ask if the bees are getting a buzz from visiting and collecting the pollen from these plants. And interestingly, arthropods as a group do not have um, those endocannabinoid receptors that we have. So they are not getting high, at least in the same way that we would, from those cannabinoid molecules. Not to say that they aren't potentially doing other things. We know, you know, cannabinoid molecules can have antimicrobial action in and of themselves. And of course, these plants are very protein rich as well. And we know that one of the um, uses of terpenes by plants is to mediate these interactions with insects and microbes, which sometimes insects will take advantage of in order to self-medicate their own microbial issues that they have either internally or in their colony. So there's a, a lot of, I think, still unexplored questions about what the cannabinoids that are in that pollen are doing internally with the bees when they consume it, but they're probably not getting a buzz. That's interesting. But so, so you're saying we may learn of other reasons for that connection down the road that we're not even aware of at this point, um, just because the research hasn't caught up with it yet. That's that's fascinating. Um, one question that this kind of brought up for me is um, thinking about bees and pesticides. And one of the reasons we would need to be more cautious with the sorts of things that we're spraying onto hemp crops so as to protect you know native bee populations and things like that um does the sort of work that you're doing help regulators make better decisions down the road as to what should be allowed and disallowed on uh, you know these crops absolutely so um fiber and grain hemp i mentioned before the flowers on that crop are really not very showy at all. And so there is already labels that are on many different pesticides that dictate when you can make applications. The label is the law there. So, um, and of course, many of them include language about not spraying onto crops that have flowers, or if your crop is in flower, that you need to do it outside of the time period when bees are actively foraging. So either in the very early morning or in the evening. And so creating this awareness that there are these beneficial insects, some of which are experiencing population declines and that we're concerned about for this very reason of pesticide exposure, um, maybe interacting with this crop in a way we had not expected is really important. Um, In terms of those who are on the high cannabinoid side, I've had a couple questions from folks who are using feminizing compounds um, or um, compounds that cause um, female plants to express male inflorescences and whether those compounds are likely to cause issues for bees that may pick up that pollen. I think most of the work that's done with those compounds that initiate male inflorescences on female plants usually are done in greenhouse or enclosed environments. But they can be very toxic to insects, um, although they're you know, not generally registered for use outdoors. So we don't know much about the potential risk to pollinators, but it's certainly something that I, I would be concerned about. This is why we have labels for pesticides that are very, very strict and why it's so important you don't do anything off label. Um, that's something that Absolutely. Suzanne has just drilled into my head over the years as, as being so important. So um, I hope folks, take that to heart. Um, Well, you know, we covered quite a bit today. Was there anything else uh, you wanted to mention while we, while we were on the line here? 
I think we have covered everything. I would certainly encourage anyone who has questions or is excited about um, entering the program or working with our students to get in touch with me through email. Um, you can find me, of course, if you go through our hemp science website. But my email is Heather Grab, all one word, at cornell.edu for those who want to just uh, send an email my way. Great. I'll put all the information and contact stuff on the podcast page as well. And, uh, you know, I, I was really energized from our phone call earlier this week. I'm really excited to hopefully collaborate and start working with you or some of your students and, uh, explore some of the, the possibilities there. So thank you for what you're, you're doing and, and seeing this research at your university is just, uh, it's incredible. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited about it, and I know our students will be as well. All right. Well, have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will talk soon. All right. Thanks for having me, Chad. That was Dr. Heather Grab with the Hemp Science Program at Cornell University, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. I'll post pertinent links on the podcast page at www.kisorganics.com. Just click on the Learn tab and then Podcast. Thanks for listening.